my name is Megan Goss and I work for MSU Extension in Michigan Sea Grant. And MSU is an affirmative action equal opportunity employer. Um, we try to uh, make all of our programming open and accessible to all. And um, this is something we strive for with all of our programming. And uh, this is something that's very important to our mission. So today, um, as part of the Conservation on Tap program uh, with Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy, uh, we're going to be discussing the Saginaw Bay Sturgeon Restoration. And to kick off the, today's meeting, I'm going to turn it over to Ted, who works for SBLC, to share a little bit more about conservation on tap before we uh, start discussing the Saginaw Bay Sturgeon Restoration. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Conservation on Tap. Uh, my name is Ted Lind, and I am the Director of Community Conservation for the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy. Um, I know we have some new people there that maybe aren't familiar with us. So I'll just give you a quick once over the world on, on the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy. Uh, we're a conservation and restoration nonprofit land trust uh, based in the Saginaw Bay watershed. Our office is in Bay City, Michigan, but we do conservation work throughout the entire watershed. Uh, primarily focusing on the counties that border the Saginaw Bay. We protect 4,000 acres of uh, conserve or conserved land, either through conservation easement or uh, through public nature preserves that we own and operate. Uh, we also do community-based projects throughout the entire watershed. So um, this is a monthly program of the Land Conservancy. So if you enjoy this topic, we look forward to having you join us again. Uh, and we typically host once a month a conservation related chat uh, on some sort of conservation topic of interest in a, a casual atmosphere. So um, you are welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation. So don't, don't feel bad if you have a question, we would rather answer that question on the slide that, uh, that the speaker is using rather than having to go back and, uh, and, and figure out what you, were, what you were trying to ask your question about. So please don't be shy ask your questions when you have them, and we will get those questions fielded by our panelists. Um, tonight, we have uh, three great panelists. We have uh, Mike Kelly, who is the director of the Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Network. And we have uh, Doug Larson. He's a research assistant with the Black River Sturgeon Facility. And then also, um, you've already heard from Megan Gass. She's the Sea Grant educator for MSU Extension. So um, all three of them are gonna be presenting tonight on uh, the sturgeon uh, in the Saginaw Bay watershed and some of the reintroduction efforts for sturgeon. Um, this is especially interesting for me because um, I'm an ice fisherman myself and uh, I've read a couple of really cool articles the last couple of years about ice fishermen catching sturgeon um, in the Saginaw River. So um, hopefully that means that this reintroduction effort is, is having an impact and we're starting to see that fish more commonly in our watershed. So um, I do have a few updates I'll give uh, on some events and stuff from SPLC, but I will uh, hold that until the end and let, let's, uh, let's dig into our topic of interest tonight, which is uh, sturgeon restoration. So without further ado, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay, that's me, right, Megan? All right, so I'm Mike Kelly with the Conservation Fund. As Ted um, mentioned, the, the Conservation Fund is a national nonprofit based out of Arlington, Virginia, um, focused really on land and water conservation across the United States. Uh, my office is located in Bay City, Michigan. Um, and from this office, we coordinate a program called the Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Network, um, which fundamentally is a regranting program. We raise uh, resources from a number of great partner foundations and corporate partners as well. Uh, and then regrant those dollars for projects that have environmental community and economic impacts to them. Um, we've been focused on sturgeon projects for a, a number of years. And so uh, it's great to have an opportunity to come on tonight and, uh, and talk a little bit about the work that, uh, that we're doing along with a, a great group of partners. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy for setting up this uh, the session this evening. This is a great opportunity for, for us to highlight what I think is perhaps um, you know, one of the most important restoration programs to have ever taken place in the Saginaw River system. Uh, Ted mentioned that, uh, that Megan will be presenting, but after me, um, Doug Larson will be presenting. And I'd like to thank Doug um, from MSU, Go Green, for being here. Um, you'll hear from him, um, but he is one of the country's leading experts on Lake Sturgeon. So it's exciting to have him here uh, tonight as part of the larger team that's making this project work. I, I will I will admit, however, it makes me a little nervous to have Doug on the line um, because uh, it makes it slightly more difficult for me because I had to revise 
some of my presentation materials a bit. I do do a, a lot of sturgeon presentations around the region. And I also have this motto that any uh, story worth telling is worth exaggerating, uh, which is wonderful because I'm not a sturgeon expert on par with Doug and that allows me some editorial freedom. So with Doug here, I need to stick with the facts or at least most of the facts. So let's just kick things off and talk a little bit about the background information about sturgeon in the Saginaw River system. Um, to begin with, um, lake sturgeon were one of the most common of all fish species in the Saginaw River system, archeological excavations um, out on the Pine River and some of them on the Chippewa River as well have found more lake sturgeon remains than any other fish. So at one time, um, lake sturgeon were uh, all over the place in all of our rivers here. Um, there are an ancient family of fish um, that dates back to the, the upper Cretaceous period. So about, about 136 million years ago. So what was going on 136 million years ago, just to give you an idea of what earth looked like at that time. Um, it was a hard life. I think if you look at the slide on the left, um, the triceratops at the bottom um, could attest to the, uh, the difficulty of, uh, of living in the upper Cretaceous period. Um, this was the high point of dinosaur, dinosaur life on Earth. And, and how do we know that? Um, we have dinosaur bones that have been carbon dated back to this period. And, and we also have these great pictures. Um, the, the one on the left was taken in Bay City's second ward. That's where the executive director of the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy lives, uh, Zach Brannigan. Um, still a, a tough, gritty neighborhood there. Um, the one on the right was taken near what is now Midland, um, out near Dow Gardens. Um, comparatively more peaceful and still a, a terrific place to, uh, to visit. Um, but at any rate, the point here is that invariably I'll do presentations and somebody will say, wow, those sturgeons are just like dinosaurs. And, uh, and my response is always, make no mistake, um, these sturgeon are dinosaurs. Uh, these are the only dinosaurs left on earth. And at least in, until somebody figures out how to go Jurassic Park on us, they, uh, they will remain uh, as the only dinosaurs on Earth. Um, just a, a, little, uh, a little background information. Um, sturgeon are, uh, are currently a threatened species in Michigan. Um, our Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Network program provided a grant to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, in the early 2000s to begin doing an analysis of, are there any sturgeon here? And if they, there are, is it a spawning population? Um, over the course of three years on research that was done on four different rivers, uh, there was no evidence found of either adult or juvenile spawning activity. So Saginaw Bay is considered to have a remnant non-spawning population. Now, having said that, the map on the right uh, is going to show you where sturgeon have been caught in commercial fishing nets. Um, there are sturgeon that move in and out of the bay, and occasionally you will hear about one being caught. Ted mentioned as in the introduction about sturgeon occasionally being caught on the Saginaw River. Um, those could be from the restoration project or they could be sturgeon that are just passing through. Um, the, the Fish and Wildlife Service in partnership with commercial netters uh, began targeting the, the commercial netters which are targeting perch, whitefish and rough, rough fish um, in about a 15 year period came up with about 360 sturgeon that were caught in their nets, tagged and then released. Um, where did they come from? We don't really know. Are they resident? Have they come up from Lake St. Clair where there is a population? Um, we, don't, uh, we don't really know that. So what happened to the lake sturgeon? Um, they outlived the Tyrannosaurus rex. They outlived the, uh, the pterodactyl. They survived through a, a couple of ice ages. They survived the largest mass extinction of plants and animals that the earth has ever seen. Uh, so what, what happened? Well, I'm embarrassed to say that, uh, that we happened. Um, humans showed up and uh, in an in a interesting hold my beer moment, um, we're able to say, hey, we know how to do extinction right. Um, and it started slowly. Um, Native Americans use sturgeon for food, oil, and leather. And probably if we would have just stopped there, sturgeon probably would have been okay. But then our ancestors came over from Europe and, and took it up a notch and by the development uh, and started the development of the commercial fishery in the Great Lakes. Um, but interestingly enough, um, to begin with, commercial fishermen didn't even target sturgeon. Um, in the early 1800s, sturgeon were viewed as a nuisance species, uh, destroying fishing nets, and then they were killed, dried, and actually burned as fuel on steamships. Um, there were so many of them. Uh, then, interestingly, in the eight, late 1800s, there became a commercial market for them, primarily in Europe. Um, so instead of 
catching and killing the sturgeon, they were caught and, uh, and, and exported to, uh, to Europe. And much of the world, by the late 1800s, much of the world's caviar supply came from the Great Lakes. Between 1900 and 1970, very little is known about sturgeon other than their populations were declining across North America. We didn't stop there. Um, enter pollution of our water, waterways, toxics that were incompatible with sturgeon and other fish populations, uh, followed closely by the logging industry and the agricultural industry uh, that allowed soil to erode from the landscape, choking our rivers and important fish spawning ground. This is a, an interesting slide, um, perhaps most damaging to the sturgeon population of the Great Lakes, and in particular the Lake Huron Basin, um, was the disconnection of these spawning fish, uh, particularly sturgeon, from areas that are required for them to spawn, gravel bottom flowing rivers. So if you look at the slide on the left, um, that's the entire pre-settlement Lake Huron Basin. So in that green area, those are all of the rivers and, uh, and waterways that drain to Lake Huron. So um, back before this area was settled, all of those rivers were open to all sorts of spawning fishes that require rivers to spawn in, but in particular, uh, sturgeon, which were, rivers are critical. They are river spawning fish. Um, after settlement, um, we have the, the picture on the right, um, and that's primarily because rivers were dammed. So you have all of that green area on the left pre-settlement that was available to spawning fish, and now the area on the right that is available to, sp to spawning fish. So it's been a, a significant impact to the waterways where sturgeon can spawn. In the Saginaw Basin, um, a lot of people I think are surprised to learn that uh, in the Saginaw Bay watershed, that area that is highlighted there, um, there are about 400 dams. And now a lot of these are not big dams. Um, many of them are what you call low head barrier dams. So barrier dams from about four feet tall to eight feet tall. Uh, these were primarily built during the logging industry or to help agriculture or prevent flooding. Uh, there are 300 dams on the Saginaw River system alone. Now, if you think about the Saginaw River watershed, that would include the Titabawassee, the Flint, the Cass, the Shiawassee, and some smaller tributaries that all drain into the Saginaw River. So when sturgeon need to spawn, they first must enter the Saginaw River and then find an adjoining river to go up. Um, and hopefully they find an adjoining river that doesn't have any dams. So setting the, the stage for sturgeon restoration, um, before we could even think about doing sturgeon restoration, we had to address some of these issues. And by and large, uh, the Clean Water Act of 1972 and general corporate responsibility, I think, took huge steps toward addressing pollution that we're seeing the results today and cleaner, higher quality waters of our Great Lakes. Um, soil erosion and sedimentation issues, uh, while still of concern, are also less linked to, linked to agencies such as the Natural Resource Conservation Service, conservation districts, uh, conservation district programs such as filter strips and set aside programs, uh, the activities of land conservancies and other groups that are working to keep land on the land and not in the water. Um, as I may have mentioned, or perhaps I skipped it, the number one pollution, pollutant of Saginaw Bay is sedimentation. It's the simple fact that soil is leaving land and entering the water uh, and, then, uh, and then destroying or covering up eggs and destroying um, important spawning habitats. So we're working on dams too. And this is something that, uh, that we like to highlight because as I mentioned earlier, uh, dams have been a, a critical issue um, for species such as walleye, trying to build spawning populations of walleye, but, uh, but also sturgeon as well. Uh, in the last 15 years, we've removed nearly a dozen dams in the Saginaw Bay watershed. Most of them have been the first dams on the tributaries that now those allow access to important spawning sites that really haven't been available for, uh, for more than 150 years. So if you look at the pictures, that is a before and after picture of the dam in Frankenmuth on the Cass River. So uh, that's a US Fish and Wildlife Service team doing a survey before that dam was removed. And then the picture on the right is the, uh, the site after the removal where uh, fish can now pass to an additional 34 miles of river on the Cass. Additional dam removal was done um, at Chesening on the Shiawassee River. This is the former site of the Chesening Dam. And I think there might be one more. Yeah, and one more here. This is um, a dam that was removed in Mount Pleasant on the Chippewa River. So we've done major dams in Vassar, Durand, Corona, Mount Pleasant, Gladwin, Frankenmuth, and Chesening. And those have been critical to kickstarting the effort for sturgeon restoration. If we couldn't get sturgeon back to their native spawning areas, um, it wouldn't make any sense to begin this restoration effort at all. So between less pollution, 
Less sedimentation in the rivers and removal of dams, the stage was set to begin the, the restoration effort. So um, I'm gonna turn that over to Doug and, uh, and allow him and his expertise to, uh, to talk about uh, what this project is and, and how it came to be and where we're heading. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate the oversell on my qualifications. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Megan uh, and the folks from Sea Grant and, and from Conservation on Tap for having me. Um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about some lake sturgeon biology and to understand uh, lake sturgeon reintroduction efforts in the Saginaw Basin. It's good to understand some basic biology, uh, really how lake sturgeon reproduce and where the pinch points might be. So lake sturgeon are an iteroparous broadcast spawner. And so iteroparous meaning they spawn or attempt to spawn many times throughout their life. Um, broadcast spawners meaning that the males and females spawn in a river system and it is exactly as it sounds. Uh, the males broadcast milk, females broadcast eggs. Fertilization occurs in the water column. Uh, the lake sturgeon life cycle is one in which adults, which are ptadromous, swim upstream, will swim up to a river known spawning site in our case, uh, the upper Black River. They'll spawn, release eggs and move back out of the river so no parental care. Uh, this is one of the most important critical periods for lake sturgeon, uh, very susceptible to predation at this point, particularly by rusty crayfish and um, native crayfish and, and other species, including other fish species. Um, after the egg stage, they hatch to a standalone free embryo period, burrow down into substrate and seek refuge from predators in some of the interstitial space in, in, in rock. After a couple of weeks, and this is temperature dependent, those fish will emerge and, and drift downstream in what is the most critical and uh, susceptible life stage, the larval stage. It's here where we see most of the predation on, on Lake Sturgeon. And so as they emerge and they drift downstream searching for food, other fish are in the river and, and, and utilize those uh, Lake Sturgeon larvae as food. And here is, is the area in which reintroduction efforts can have the greatest impact. Um, this is where we generally remove this stage or uh, do an end around at this stage and focus on hatchery reintroduction efforts. And, and that's what we specialize in here. Um, in 2012, the state of Michigan, Department of Natural Resources published their Michigan Lake Sturgeon Rehabilitation Strategy in which they seek to develop self-sustaining populations to allow lake sturgeon. Um, to, to recover in areas that they've been historically populated. We're looking to do this in a way in which we can conserve populations that are self-sustaining, supplement those populations, rehabilitate depressed populations, and then reintroduce lake sturgeon to suitable habitat and vacant habitat, all while maintaining uh, the genetic diversity that we've seen historically on a population that's now down to about 1% of its, its historic spawning. Uh, this project specifically focuses on rehabilitation efforts in the Saginaw River system. So the Saginaw River system is highly connected to Lake Huron, some other systems on which in which Lake Sturgeon spawn not so connected. Um, and, and this connectivity is something that we consider when developing rehabilitation strategies. And so uh, rather than in focusing a stocking effort on one system in the Saginaw River, we look at the watershed as a whole. Uh, we view these systems as connected and these sturgeon can move freely between these systems and then out to Lake Huron. So it's really important to, to, to focus on the connectivity in these systems when you're talking about reintroduction efforts. Um, Mike talked about this a little bit uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit again for those of you just joining us. Um, but the goal of this system is to, re or this project is to, to rehabilitate Lake Sturgeon in the Saginaw system while also um, having some smaller goals of, of looking at uh, straying rates of Lake Sturgeon based on uh, areas in which they were raised or systems in which they were raised and uh, to focus on building a genetically diverse adult population that can eventually sustain itself in the Saginaw system. Uh, we're very early into this reintroduction effort. Uh, for perspective, we've been doing this now for about three years on the upper Black River where we're starting to see progress, um, major progress. Uh, we've been working on that system for roughly 20 years. So lake sturgeon are a species in which the males are reproductively uh, mature in about 15 years roughly females closer to 20 years. And so this is a, a long-term effort, but we're well on our way in the Saginaw system. And then we wanna look at some of the different populations that we can uh, stock in. And so there's a, a stock that's brought up from the uh, Southern Lake Huron gamete source, which is done by Fish and Wildlife Service. And then the stock that we bring down from the upper Black River in the Sheboygan River watershed. 
And then of course, um, the folks at Sea Grant do a great job of building public support and, and looking at outreach efforts that we can do and, and we focus on that uh, Black River Sturgeon facility. So when we talk about Lake Sturgeon uh, reintroduction efforts, it's a little bit different than you may have seen before. Uh, most of you who visited hatcheries in the past are used to going to Wolf Lake or Odin or some of these beautiful state facilities that are brick and mortar that have been there for a while. Um, Lake Sturgeon are a little different. Uh, they are actually raised in much smaller quantity because uh, they take such a long time to reach adulthood that if we stock thousands at a time, we can dramatically affect a population with one year class. Whereas uh, if we stock smaller quantities, we can manage a population more effectively over a longer period of time. And we do that using streamside rearing facilities. On, on this slide, you'll see a couple of examples of some streamside rearing facilities. And you'll notice they're, they're, they're very, uh, able to move. Um, they look like they're set up. These are all trailer facilities that I'm showing you here. Um, as time has gone on and, and we've had a little bit more experience doing this, we've been able to establish some semi-permanent facilities on the upper Black River, um, the Little River Band, uh, um, Little River, the Little, Little River Band in um, Manistee is also set up now a brick and mortar facility, but these facilities are set up adjacent to the water bodies in which we're trying to stock sturgeon. And the reason we do that is, is a fewfold. The first being that setting up on the natal stream allows us to raise the sturgeon in waters in which we're going to release them. And so lake sturgeon, like salmonid species, imprint on the water in which they're raised. And by imprint, I mean they can recognize that water signature. And as adults, they'll return to that river. And so the best way to ensure that they are able to return to the river in which they were spawned is by raising them in the water in which they were. So these facilities are set up um, across Michigan, Wisconsin, and now uh, into Ohio with the introduction of the Maumee River Trailer. And then another major benefit to these systems is that by using the adjacent water bodies, you save quite a bit of money in the reintroduction effort by not having the warm water, not having to use uh, uh, stream water, or not having to use, excuse me, uh, well water. We can do it with the water from the area these fish are raised. So it's all about using the natal water. Um, so I mentioned that there are two uh, donor populations to this system, uh, Black Lake up in Sheboygan County, Michigan. Uh, it's near Onaway on the upper Black River. Uh, the facility itself, uh, as you'll see here in the next slide, is uh, immediately below Kleber Dam. And then the uh, Southern Lake Huron system in which the fish are collected in Port Huron near the Blue Water Bridge. And then the upper Black River site, as I mentioned, is immediately downstream of Cleaver Dam. Um, if you get a chance, other than uh, this year in which we couldn't visit with folks, it's a great place to come uh, check out sturgeon population restoration, both during the adult spawning run, and then as the summer goes on and we're raising fingerlings for stock. Uh, we did the primary stocking effort for Black Lake, which is 500 fish per year, Mullet Lake, an additional 500 fish per year, and then the Saginaw River system in which we're looking to stock 125 fish in each of four tributaries. Hey, Doug, this is, uh, we did have our first question come through. We had someone ask uh, about the uh, Black Lake fishing and if, uh, if you individuals are allowed to ice fish for sturgeon on Black Lake. That's a great question. Thank you to uh, the viewer that sent in that question. And, and yeah, there is a season for uh, lake sturgeon fishing on Black Lake. Um, I say it's a season, it's more uh, an effort that lasts uh, a few hours on the first Saturday in February. Uh, I encourage you to check out the Sturgeon for Tomorrow website, check out the Sturgeon for Tomorrow chapter website here in Onaway. They provide great information about the sturgeon spawning uh, season. And then of course, check out the MDNR website. They also provide great information on that season. Um, it's a spearing season through the ice and it usually lasts between um, you know, just under an hour to uh, I think the longest in my time has been uh, a season that lasted uh, eight or so hours. And, and that was actually last year. So um, it's a pretty quick season, but it's a, a huge event. We usually get uh, something in the range of 400 plus shanties set up every year, looking to catch uh, seven fish. So there's a, uh, it's a very quick season. Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, question. they do a big like outdoor festival along with that on Black Lake too, don't they? Yeah, Sturgeon for Tomorrow puts on what's called the uh, the Black Lake Shivery. And again, I'll, I'll point you to their website for more information on that. But uh, they refer to it as the biggest party on the ice up here. Um, <laughs> it's a, I mean, it, I've been to it a few times, of course, in a professional capacity. And it is, it is pretty cool to, uh, to see how passionate folks are about uh, both the sturgeon restoration effort and of course the fruits of that river. Sure. Well, hey, um, for, for viewers, we will definitely post links to 
um, some of those things that Doug's mentioning at the end. Yeah, and even if you don't fish, you are still able to come up and, and see the event as it goes on. It's pretty fun. It's uh, They set up a, a tent on the ice and uh, have a couple of days of uh, frivolities and fishing. Um, talking a little bit about our population, just for some information, and of course it, it provides me the opportunity then to, to show some cool GoPro video. Uh, the Black River population, when the uh, restoration effort started in the late 90s, early 2000s was pretty well depressed. Uh, the calculated estimate for the population size was between 350 and 400 individuals. Um, and that work was done by Dr. Kim Scribner, Dr. Ed Baker, and Dr. Shirley Pledger, two of whom are on this call today. Um, they published a great paper in 2013, which tracked uh, and, and developed a method for estimating the population uh, size of this system over the 20 year period or so that we've been doing work. And, and over the last uh, roughly 18 years, that population has grown to uh, about 1,197 individuals or so. Um, it's pretty close to an even split. It's, it's um, about 650 or so males to 550 or so females. Um, every year we put out a, an extensive effort to uh, sample the adult population. We do that in two different ways. One, every fish that's in the system is tagged with an RFID tag, which for any of you that have dogs is a very large version of the same tag that they uh, that dogs are implanted with. And it allows us to actively track fish, or passively track fish, excuse me, as they move upstream. And we also do a hand capture survey, which is pretty neat. Uh, you'll see here in this picture, we go out with large D-frame, uh, excuse me, large uh, frame nets and and we swim downstream and, and net sturgeon as we encounter them. And I've got some cool video to show you what that looks like. Um, the facility was originally constructed for about 3,200 fish. Um, we're raising about 1,500 a year now, like I said. And then uh, we partner with the Little Traverse Bay Bands, Wodaw Indians. We'll also have a facility in the, uh, in the area in Pelston. And they raise an additional 500 fish. And they help us out with the sturgeon in the classroom. Hey, Doug, we did have one more question come in. Uh, Shaley Valentine on, um, on Zoom asks, what is the dynamic rates of fish stocked in Burt and Mullet Lakes? If that's a number you might have. Uh, that's a good question, Shaley. I don't have it. I'd be happy to reach out to you after the Zoom call is over to talk to you a little bit more about that. Uh, great question. But uh, in terms of what's been stocked annually, it's been uh, about 500 fish or so every year since 2000 and 15, but prior to that, it was roughly 3,200 fish a year, plus or minus. So um, just as another kind of summary of how things have been have gone at the Black River Project, uh, MSU has been a part of this project since 2003. Early uh, parts of this project were done by uh, MDNR, Dave Borgeson and Ed Baker did a lot of the early work. And then Central Michigan University under Dr. Tracy Galerowitz did some work in the early 2000s. But uh, the early efforts were simply to evaluate the population size uh, characterize the larval drift chronology and profile, and evaluate any juvenile survival that might exist and contribute to annual recruitment annually. And what they found in the early years was, simply put, it's a very, it was a very small population that uh, was in need of restoration, and, the, and that's where stocking efforts came from. Fast forward to 2003 when Michigan State University took over. Uh, Michigan State University took over in 2003 and began some of the early streamside rearing um, in this modified Quonset hut in 2005 near the Black Lake, Black River mouth, excuse me. Um, we moved into our current home, which is immediately downstream of Cleaver Dam in 2009 and expanded our mandate from uh, restoration efforts to research. And, and so I say whenever I do one of these talks that I have just the coolest job in the world um, in my humble opinion, uh, this facility produces some of the best research on Lake Sturgeon, and certainly in the Great Lakes region, um, uh, most of the, the bibliography on uh, Lake Sturgeon predation and, and Lake Sturgeon reproductive effort comes from this facility. It's really cool. I encourage you, uh, in a slide later in this talk, I have a, a, a link to some of the publications we've done. We provide those on our website, I encourage you to take a look. There's some great information there. A number of graduate students over the years, technicians, employees, uh, project principal investigators have done some great work here. Um, and it's really contributed to the, the overall knowledge of Lake Sturgeon in general. Um, and this is just a sampling of some of the things that we've done, um, recruitment impediments, reproductive ecology, uh, growth studies, a lot of the hatchery uh, 
methodology for streamside facilities comes from, from Black Lake. So really uh, can't say enough about the research that we've done. We had another question come in off of Facebook. Uh, we have a viewer that's interested in some fish biology and wants to know a little bit more about the whiskers on the sturgeon and what they might be used for. Uh, uh, those are called barbels. And uh, those barbels are a sensory uh, device that Lake Sturgeon use. Essentially, they run across the substrate. They can be used as a way of detecting substrate and, and detecting uh, uh, food sources that are available. So these guys are very much opportunistic feeders um, and we use those barbels kind of the same way that, uh, similar in, into the way that uh, other organisms with external digits, if you will, will, uh, will use for sensory. Good question. Um, so one of the questions I get constantly is what does it look like when we're underwater? And so I, I love to share these videos. On the left, you'll see what it looks like when we do our jobs great. Um, we swim, we catch fish, they come up, we look really cool. Um, but this is on the right is what it looks like most of the time where we dive down and we try to catch fish and we fail miserably over and over and over again. And then maybe we'll get lucky and we'll finally find, catch a fish. But more often than not, when you miss, it means you're getting out of the river with uh, about 15% of your body weight extra on you for buoyancy, walking back upstream and doing it over and over again uh, until you capture fish. And some of us are, are really good at it and we can do it in a single pass. Others, it can be a very long day of walking upstream. So it is a really fun job. Um, I encourage anybody who is interested, there's a slide a little bit later talking about the sturgeon guard. If you wanna see us interact with these fish up close, uh, hopefully in 2021, the sturgeon guard is a, a group of uh, locals and then folks from other places throughout the state and, and in some cases through other states that, that come out and, and watch us catch these fish and then they actively, uh, uh, protect fish from, from um, illegal harvest during this period of time when they're so vulnerable. So if you wanna see this live, it's really cool to see live, come check it out. But just a quick uh, background too about the Southern Lake Huron population, which is the other donor population for this system. Um, quite a bit different, uh, obviously the St. Clair River, Detroit River, those areas are a lot wider, a lot deeper and a lot faster than the Upper Black River. Upper Black River is only about 20 meters wide and it moves at about a meter per second, which is not very fast. Uh, the St. Clair and Detroit rivers move quite a bit faster than that, and certainly you can't walk across them like we can in the black. Um, but like us, they handle between 150 to 250 or so fish every year. Uh, uh, several different gear types, they do some trawl surveys and some set line surveys. And their most recent estimate of the adult population, taking into account several years of, of capture, is about 15,000 uh, population, whereas Black River, like I said, is just much bigger population, but uh, uh, we have a little bit better opportunity to catch uh, most of the spawning population. We estimate that we're able to handle about 70% of the population every year. So uh, we, get, we get our hands on pretty good. Uh, that's not to say that they don't in the Southern Lake Huron population, but two vastly different systems. Um, because they don't have the opportunity to, to dive down and catch these fish when they're spawning and they have to catch them with some of the more, the passive gear types, they have to use a little bit different methodology for catching these fish. And so I mentioned that, that lake sturgeon are drifting fish after they, they hatch and they emerge. Um, so we actually are able to take advantage of that and catch drifting uh, naturally produced lake sturgeon as they move out of the system. Uh, well, they can do that in this population. It's uh, quite a bit more labor intensive than they can, uh, they can put forward for that. And so they actually capture these fish on, on passive gears, bring them back. Uh, to their facilities and, and hold them and treat them with common carp pituitary hormone, which allows the eggs to, to ripen up to a point where they can actually do egg and milk fertilizations in house. Um, they do that and they try to do it in such a way as to, to, to fertilize about 40 males with uh, at least 10 or so females every year. Um, and the goal is to, to diversify that population as much as possible with the number of fish that they're able to bring back and, and actually spawn. Uh, different procedure for sure, but super cool to see uh, up close and, and make sure you check out some of their events uh, when they have those fish in the tanks down at the Blue Water, Blue Water Bridge area. So I mentioned that uh, we our stocking is about 125 fish for each of four rivers every year. So this is our target for the Saginaw system. Uh, we stock four rivers, the Cass River, Flint River, Shiawassee River, and the Titabawassee River. We're targeting 125 fish for each of those systems from the Black River population and then another 125 
uh, from Southern Lake Huron for a total stocking effort of about 250 fish per year per river. Uh, obviously that means that the effort is looking to stock about a thousand. Fortunately though, as Megan moves to the next slide, you'll see we've been a little bit more uh, successful than that. Um, this effort started in 2017 um, and we were able to stock about 193 fish into one river for that effort. And in the successive years, when we really had a chance to hash out a plan for stocking these systems, uh, we've stocked quite a bit more than that. And in total, um, I'm happy to report that in the three or so years that we've been doing this, we've stocked 3,325 fish into the Saginaw Bay watershed since 2017. Our goal was to stock another 1,000 fish this year. Um, unfortunately, uh, we had to put a pause on stocking efforts for 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but it uh, sounds like things are going to be, uh, I'm optimistic things will be back uh, on pace in, in 2021. We're hoping to do this effort for at least 10 years right now um, with paired plantings from the Southern Lake Huron population and the black population. Um, and we'll see where it goes from there. And finally, uh, one of the questions we get all the time is, well, you stock so many fish every year, how are you able to tell who those fish are, what those fish do, um, if they're going to return to the system, and how do you know that your effort has worked? And so, again, we stock everything in the Black River, it gets tagged with a, what's called a passive integrated transponder tag or a pit tag, same exact technology as the fish that, uh, or excuse me, the tags that, are, that go into your pets at home. Um, we're able to use that along with a combination of capture methodology and passive antennas across the system, and in, in some cases, uh, acoustic telemetry uh, to really evaluate what these fish are doing after we release them. And so we know a lot um, about the impediments to reproductive success and, and the impediments to recruitment every year. But uh, we're still learning a lot about what happens to the juveniles after they're past that first critical, that major critical period in which uh, they're very susceptible to predation. And so our hope is that over the next 10 years or so, we can really start to uh, look at some of these fish that were stocked from different systems and, and how they return to the rivers that they, they were released into relative to the rivers they were raised in. Um, look, at it, look to see if there's different rates of straying from these populations and really evaluate uh, Really, uh, Saginaw provides us with this excellent opportunity to uh, really talk about the relationship between uh, the Great Lake systems and their connectivity to some of these smaller water, uh, these smaller watershed areas. And so it's it's really super cool to uh, uh, to do a project like this where we get to follow uh, such a long-lived fish species from uh, the younger stages and into adulthood. Hey Doug, we had a couple more questions come in on uh, on Facebook. Um, so uh, uh, Mary Paulson asked, how many fish were caught this past year uh, during that open fishing season? And what was the largest fish caught, if you know? I'm, uh, could you repeat that question? I'm sorry. Uh, how many fish were caught th and this year and tagged? And what was the biggest? Uh, great question. We, uh, we had a much more protracted effort this year. Um, we weren't able to deploy the full effort that we would normally uh, deploy in a year. So we caught 140 this year. And the biggest fish always come in around six feet. What, what's a typical year? If 140 is what you had this year, what, what would you call as your, what would you say is your typical tagging effort then? Uh, if you remove this year from the equation in general, we catch uh, roughly 199 to 290 fish is the range that we've been in over the years. Um, but yeah, a typical year is in the 220 or so range for adults for us. Nice. Couple more questions before you move on to your next slide. Um, Mia, one of our Mia Benashik, one of our partners from the Saginaw Children's Zoo, asked about the the short fishing sturgeon season or uh, sturgeon fishing season that you mentioned. Um, are the is the sturgeon fishing a trophy effort or are they um, are they eaten and um, are they kept or are they then released? I, I think you mentioned it was a spearing season, so I'm assuming they're keeping them if they're spearing. Yeah, it's a through the ice spearing effort, and so. Um, the fish that are, are, are harvested or kept. Um, as to what's done with them, you know, some of the, the fishermen eat them. It's not, uh, I would not call it a trophy effort. It's definitely a, a subsistence effort in most cases. Um, so no, not a trophy. Sure. And then I think um, maybe this uh, last question, I think is a question for Mike um, with the Sturgeon in the Classroom program. And um, they ask uh, how many schools were a part of that program? 
Uh, another great question. So it, it varies year to year and there are multiple programs ongoing right now. The Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa Indians have an effort that, that we all collaborate on um, in which they, they have uh, around five classrooms. And then the main program that's done by, uh, what's actually mostly put on by um, uh, Surgeon for Tomorrow, the Black League chapter, they do uh, a stocking, or excuse me, a surgeon in the classroom effort of uh, roughly 20 classes is what they're shooting for every year, but it varies year to year. In some sure. years, there are more, more classes. Sure, and I think we even had a couple, we at least had a few classrooms locally that I know of that did the, the sturgeon too. Yeah, I believe two classrooms in Saginaw, is that right, Mike? Yes, yeah, one, it is. One in Saginaw and one in Franklin North. Mm -hmm. And we'll be learning about that shortly in the community uh, connection section. Are there any right. other questions? Uh, that's all I saw for now, so let's uh, let's keep moving. Okay, sounds great. Um, well, to introduce myself again, um, my name's Megan Goss, and I serve locally as a Michigan State University Extension a Sea Grant Educator, um, where we work to help connect uh, the Lake Sturgeon uh, restoration effort with the community across the Saginaw Bay watershed. Um, so one way that we do that is through community relief celebrations. So in normal years around this time, we're hosting public release events where people can actually come out, see the Lake Sturgeon restoration, um, help release the fish in the water. Um, and then they can also learn about ways that they can help protect and uh, support sturgeon restoration in the watershed. Um, so here are some photos from last year's events. Um, this one on the left uh, is from the Flint uh, river release event, uh, which took place at the same time that they were unveiling the new kayak launch that's at the um, Mott Park Recreation Area. And then also the other photo was from uh, the Titiboasi release site, which is at the Bob Caldwell boat launch. So here's a map of the different sturgeon release celebrations. And this is really building a partnership across the watershed um, that's connecting the federal and state partners that are working uh, to restore Lake Sturgeon and then working with local partners, um, including uh, the Chippewa Nature Center, uh, the Friends of the Shiawassee River, the City of Frankenmuth, and the Flint, Flint River Watershed Coalition um, to support these public release events where people can come out and release uh, the fish into the water. So it's a really a great time and we hope next year we will be able to host these uh, release events again. Unfortunately, we were not able to host them um, this year due to COVID-19, uh, but here's a map of um, the locations and we will also be sharing a copy of this presentation in case you wanna find out more information about uh, ways to get involved in these uh, community release celebrations. Um, with the sturgeon for the, the sturgeon in the classroom program, which was um, previously discussed, um, this is a program that locally is facilitated by the Sturgeon for Tomorrow program, um, with support from local partners, um, including the Saginaw Bay Watershed Initiative Network, uh, MSU Extension, Michigan Sea Grant, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they uh, work to connect uh, local schools with a sturgeon that they get to rear over the course of the school year and then they release it into a local river. So um, St. Lawrence School and White Pine Middle School will both be receiving their sturgeon next month um, and they release their sturgeon into the Cass and uh, Titabawasi rivers respectively. And there will also be a um, new, high high, new high profile public location in the Saginaw Bay watershed um, this year as well and um, we will be uh, unveiling that news um, sometime uh, in the future, but really excited to have another way for people to connect with Sturgeon throughout the year. Um, in addition to supporting the Sturgeon in the Classroom program, the Saginaw Bay Sturgeon Restoration Partnership also supports professional development opportunities, uh, working in partnership with the Sturgeon for Tomorrow and the Northeast Michigan Great Lakes Stewardship Initiative. We're able to host a um, training uh, with um, Doug and uh, Chris Day from uh, the Little Traverse Bay Band of Adawa Indians, where they were able to share um, 
ways, best practices for uh, rearing the sturgeon for the aquarium management, but also uh, we were able to provide some curricular connections as well. And you can see from one of the photos, this is uh, very similar to the experience that you would get in the sturgeon guard. So we were able to come out and see some of the research uh, that was going on. And um, this is right near Onaway, which is uh, one of the, the Lake Sturgeon capital of Michigan. And this is a really cool uh, welding art project that was uh, made by Moran Ironworks. So definitely something worth checking out um, if you are doing the Sturgeon Guard. Uh, really so, State Park campground there at uh, Onaway State Park too, right on uh, Black Lake. Mm -hmm. And with the Sturgeon Guard program, Ted, you actually can camp right on site, like right by the Black River. So they have camping locations there. You just need to um, sign up ahead of time. And they have a whole program for um, getting to volunteer. But like Doug mentioned, it's a really great opportunity to help protect Lake Sturgeon. And this is a way of helping to prevent them from being poached um, and being used as a caviar source, which is still a threat for Lake Sturgeon. Um, so we want to help protect them as much as we can when they spawn. And like Ted and Doug have mentioned, this is also a really beautiful part of Michigan. So it's worth going out. I was lucky enough to do the Sturgeon Guard a few years ago. And my only recommendation would be make sure you use a um, GPS uh, location to get there and not um, instructions, uh, not plugging in a location on your uh, maps. Because when I tried to do the latter, I got very lost and it was a very comical experience, but the cell service is not to the best out there. So that would just be my one uh, pro tip from my experience of getting lost for about two hours trying to find the site. <laughs> Uh, in addition uh, to the Sturgeon Guard and the Sturgeon in the Classroom opportunities, uh, the Black Lake River Facility with MSU uh, Department of Fisheries and Wildlife is launching a Sturgeon Community Science opportunity. Um, we will be unveiling a pilot opportunity later this year where teachers can sign up, where their students can actually help uh, collect community science and learn more about the predator-prey relationship in uh, the Black River system. Doug, do you want to speak a little bit more to the, the community science opportunity that's available? Yeah, Megan, sure. Um, really quick. Um, yeah, so we have a great citizen science effort that's uh, a project that was funded by the um, um, Great Lakes Fisheries Trust that we've been working on for a couple of years. Uh, we had the opportunity to place some underwater cameras below the uh, FL5 bridge, which allowed us to monitor the fish populations of other non-sturgeon species moving upstream. Um, we're converting that into a, a lesson set in which community members, uh, both at the academic level um, and, and you know, community level too, will be able to help us with those videos, look at the videos and, and give us an idea of the fish that are passing uh, those cameras during the spawning run. And we hope to use that information um, to get a, a better understanding of, of the predator community for larval lake sturgeon. So we hope to be rolling that out um, with uh, assistance from Michigan Sea Grant and other partners in 2021. Yes, so if you know of any teachers that might be interested, please reach out to Doug or myself. We'll be sharing our emails shortly. Um, and if you are interested in exploring Lake Sturgeon more, they do have a great website, glsturgeon.com, um, where you can learn more about Lake Sturgeon biology, uh, Great Lakes ecosystems, and they also have an education and outreach section, which is filled with a lot of great um, lessons and curriculum for connecting sturgeon in the classroom in case uh, there are any teachers that are joining us on uh, the Zoom or Facebook Live. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mike, who's going to share more about other ways that you can help support the Lake Sturgeon restoration in the Saginaw Bay watershed. Thanks, Megan. Um, one of the things that we did do because we knew that this was a fairly high, high profile program with a lot of interest was create a website. So if you want to learn more about the Saginaw Bay Sturgeon effort, go ahead and, uh, and go into saginawbaysturgeon.org. Um, lots of really good information there about, uh, about the program opportunities there to be a contributor to the effort to help fund the effort that uh, that we're, uh, we're undertaking here, helping to supply the uh, uh, the hatchery with food as well as support the school based programming. Um, lots of opportunities to do that. Uh, we have certificates of adoption, you can adopt a sturgeon. Um, these are all as Doug said all pit tagged in and, uh, and when a sturgeon is caught, um, we can let you know where and when your sturgeon was caught. 
as well as other ways for you to be a contributor as well. So if you're interested in uh, uh, helping to fund some of these projects, there are t-shirts available, um, really cool t-shirts that have sturgeon scoots on the back. Um, you can't get them anywhere else, but on this, uh, on this website. The exclusive sturgeon t-shirts there. Exclusive, right? it's the only yeah. place you can get it. They're really cool, the scoots are awesome. I'm, I'm actually wearing one right now. I'm just gonna show it off while we're on the topic, if I can. So you can see the scoots. <laughs> we have our own model. Thanks, Megan. And finally, just to wrap things up, um, something that uh, that we thought was pretty neat happened back in 2019. I'd like to introduce you to uh, to Blake Smith of Saginaw. Um, and at the time, he was 14 years old. And Blake was ice fishing in February of 2019 um, and caught a sturgeon through the ice. And there is no sturgeon season in the, uh, in the Lake Huron watershed, or at least on the Saginaw River system. Um, in fact, I, I think, Doug, the only sturgeon season in Michigan is on Black Lake, correct? That's the only sturgeon season that's available. Or um, there's, a, there's a catch and release uh, season. Uh, on, on the, the St. Clair? On the St. Clair, yep. And then okay. there's some other uh, seasons. So on Seagull Lake has a season as well. Gotcha. It's got a very tight gotcha. slot like that. So, so Blake here um, caught a sturgeon through the ice, um, took a picture of it and, uh, and released it in February of 2019. Now, Blake didn't really probably know the importance of that fish. That is the first juvenile sturgeon that we know of on record that's been caught in the Saginaw system in more than 100 years. So um, each one of these tags, as Doug mentioned, each one of these fish, as Doug mentioned, has a pit tag. Uh, of course, um, Blake didn't have a... Uh, a pit tag reader with them. So it's our best guess that this is one of the fish that has been released early on in the sturgeon restoration effort. Um, but to double down on that, um, Blake went back out in December of 2019 and caught a second sturgeon. Um, if you're a golfer, this is like hitting two holes in one in your entire golfing career. This is uh, incredibly rare. So if you see Blake, um, go up to him and shake his hand or get a fist bump or something and maybe some of his good luck will wear off on you. Uh, because this is an extraordinarily rare occurrence. And, and the beauty of it really today is that people have cell phones with cameras. Um, and so we have, uh, we have proof that juvenile sturgeon um, have been caught in the Saginaw system. And, uh, and Blake Smith has caught two of them. And, uh, and like I said, these are the first juvenile young sturgeon that have been caught in more than 100 years. And I think that does it, Megan. Yes, it does. That wraps up our formal um, presentation and I'll be sharing um, the uh, presentation link with everyone. So if you have any additional questions that you don't want to address right now, um, you can send those to Mike, Doug or myself. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can have more of a Brady Bunch view in case um, anyone has any questions that they would like to ask. Hey, well, I guess while we're waiting to see if anyone has some questions, I'll just run through a couple updates, um, you know, from some partners in the area. I saw uh, Dennis Plasky from Chippewa Nature Center was on our on our Zoom call. So I have to give a plug to uh, the Banff Mountain Film Festival that's going to be coming up soon. Um, if you are a, uh, a lover of outdoor films and hiking and biking and rock climbing and, and any any kind of film dealing with the outdoors, Chippewa Nature Center puts on an awesome film festival every year um, in partnership with the Banff, uh, Banff Mountain Film Festival, and they're one of the, the stops for the tour. Um, this year, uh, as you can expect, the tour is virtual, but you can still view the films and uh, registration details are on the Chippewa Nature Center website. Um, the Land Conservancy, Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy has been a supporter of the film festival for a number of years now, and, uh, and the Chippewa Nature Center has been a strong partner of ours too. So. Um, we, we always uh, love to attend that ourselves, and, and uh, it's a great film festival for anyone that's interested in, in outdoor films. And I got to gotta thank you from Dennis. So uh, we, we, hope you'll, uh, we hope you guys will check that out. I know I'm going to be watching those films with my family, too. Um, another one, uh, I know uh, Mia Benashik from the Saginaw Children's Zoo was on, so I got to give a plug to, to Zoo Boo. So if you're looking for an opportunity to get your kids out and do a trick-or-treating like activity. Uh, you can go check out the Saginaw Children's Zoo. They're gonna have some Halloween themed uh, uh, play items for the animals. Uh, the alligator will likely chomp a pumpkin in half. So that's kind of cool to see. Uh, and then they have some goodie bags for kids as you leave the zoo. So it's not gonna be the same as in years past where you trick-or-treat your way through the zoo. Uh, you basically can go to the zoo and view the, uh, the enrichment and the animals and stuff uh, in your costumes and such. And then they have some goodie bags for 
uh, for kids as you leave. So feel free to check that out. Um, I do have a couple SBLC programs, I guess I'd like to uh, give a little plug to uh, here at the end. Um, we do have a fall mushroom walk out at the McLean Nature Preserve uh, this upcoming Sunday at 3 p.m. So if you're interested in that, the event is posted on the Saginaw Basin Land Conservancy Facebook page. So check that out or you're welcome to email Trevor at sblc-mi.org for details. Uh, my colleague Trevor will be leading uh, uh, will be leading and attending that event with Jim McLean out at the McLean Nature Preserve. Aside from that, we have a couple of community cleanups as part of our vacant land restoration effort in Saginaw. We'll have one uh, on September 30th in the afternoon on the 1100 block of Warren Avenue. And then we'll have one on October 6th at uh, the corner of 9th and Carlisle Street in Saginaw. So if you're interested in helping with a little, little litter cleanup on some vacant property in Saginaw, we have a couple community cleanups. Um, that is it as far as uh, you know our own events at the Land Conservancy and some of those partner events that I wanted to give a plug to. Um, I haven't seen any new questions come in on Facebook and it doesn't look like any new questions have come in on Zoom. So um, I guess, we will, you're, you're welcome to email or contact any of us with those questions after the fact. And we are, we're happy to reply to you individually. Uh, Megan, go ahead. I have a question that I get a lot when I give presentations related to sturgeon and I'd like to hear Doug's response. So on the back of my shirt, I showed off these scoots, but what happens to the scoots as sturgeon get older? The question, Megan. Um, more often than not, they rub down uh, as these fish, because they are benthivorous and, and swim upstream, they rub down over time and uh, they're not really evolutionarily necessary after they reach the stage in which they're most vulnerable to predation. So just over time, they, they kind of dull out on rocks, but occasionally we will see a fish, a young male in the river who hasn't quite worn his scutes down um, and, and they're pretty sharp still, even at, uh, you know, 10 plus years old. Great, thanks for sharing that information. I, I guess if there's uh, no other questions, um, I'd just like to thank our presenters, uh, Mike, uh, Doug, and Megan for uh, you know taking time out of your busy schedules to, uh, to uh, present on Great Lakes Sturgeon Restoration. Um, I, I, I can tell you that based on our, our Facebook Live number and then also those that were tuned in on Zoom, this was uh, our most popular session so far. So you have the distinction of being uh, you know, the most popular conservation on tap session. And um, thank you again so much for taking time out of your schedules to join us. Thank you to all the viewers that uh, joined us tonight. And um, we look forward to seeing you next month uh, for Conservation on Tap. Thanks for having us. Thank you.